faith. What is it? Being sure of our hope. Convinced of what we can't see. By faith, we understand the world was set in order at God's command. By faith, Abel offered God a greater sacrifice than Cain, and for his faith, God commended him as righteous. By faith, Noah trusted God and constructed an ark for the deliverance of his family. By faith, Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son, believing God would still fulfill his promises. By faith, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. By faith, God's chosen nation crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and praised him as it swallowed up the Egyptians. By faith, Rahab the prostitute escaped destruction because she welcomed the spies in peace. Time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, David, and the prophets. By faith, they administered justice, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire. But others were imprisoned, murdered, and wandered in deserts, mountains, and openings in the earth. We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So get rid of every weight, of every sin, and run. Run with endurance the race set before us. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the champion and guide of our faith. For promised joy, he endured the cross, thought nothing of its shame, and having risen again, has been handed his deserved glory at the right hand of the throne of God. All right, well, good morning. Um, I'm really excited today because I want to talk to you about the last part of this, um, but the goal is to kind of bring all this together. So if uh, I think most people have been in here that have been with us for the series, um, um, but basically we've been looking at this uh, series called Echoes, and the goal was is to look at uh, the history of the church and how that kept pushing us forward um, to where we are today. And so... Um, Basically, in a nutshell, what I want to do today is I want to, I want to, I want to show you how following Christ is a lifestyle, um, and, and, and what we are to look at and how we are to go about, um, every single day of our life, how we are to live life to the fullest, uh, to get the most out of life. Um, and it's not just because, you know, the pastor says so, not just because we even read the scripture, um, but I want to convince you today a lot of it is that, um, but it's because of a single event known as the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, there's none of this, right? There, there's no, there's no Christianity, there's no church, there's no movement. It's seriously all about a single event, and that event was the resurrection. And, um, and because of the resurrection, um, the goal was to see what did men and women do along history that teaches us how to keep going. Like we have this, we have this, um, uh, heroes of the faith, in a sense, heroes of the church that have gone before us, normal men and women, normal men and women who Hold, held on to something of scripture, held on to the resurrection and said, I can do that. I can be a part of this. I can, I can change the world. And to them, they weren't thinking about changing it for millions and millions of people. That wasn't their mindset. Their mindset was my neighborhood, my, my community, the place that I live in, the, the world that I'm a part of. Like that's, that's what I can do. And that was the whole goal of everything that we, that, uh, that was all about. So the last three weeks, we looked at Francis of Assisi. We talked about, um, his desire to help the poor, uh, physically help the poor and to help the poor in spirit. Those who don't know Christ, you know, those who are struggling with spirituality and things, he wanted to help them, uh, because of Matthew chapter 10. Uh, we looked at Thomas Aquinas and his goal was to bring together, uh, the idea of faith and intellect that you don't need to separate those. In fact, the more, the more you understand the world, the deeper you, relationship you can have with God because of scripture. It's just incredible what he came about. Of course, he was challenged by the church. And then Julian of Norwich, which we got into last week. Uh, I got a little excited last week. And um, uh, the goal was 
uh, with her story to show us that in the midst of all the trials and, and the temptations and, and, and the hurt and the pain and the suffering that goes on in the world, we can still keep moving on. We can still keep marching on for the glory of God because of the church, because we believe in the resurrection. And it's because of the resurrection that we are excited about what God can do in us and through us. And so I want to quick tell you a story. Um, when I was 17, when I was 17 years old, I, um, that's about the time I gave my life to Jesus. It was, I don't actually remember any. You know, I know a lot of people have that, well, you should know the date, time, hour, moment. That wasn't me. Like that, I don't, that wasn't true for me. It was, uh, it was a summer that transformed my life forever. And, um, and that summer, I came to know Christ. I came to want more of Him. And, and, and there's, so really, there's a whole lot of the story there. But I want to share two things from when I, when I found Jesus um, about a friend. Um, I had a friend who was constantly trying to get me to church, specifically to youth group, and um, started going to a thing called Youth for Christ. And, and when I found him, and like I would say, a lot of times I like to tell people, when Jesus found me, because, you know, I was the one that was missing. I was gone. And, and he grabbed a hold of my life, um, that two things happened to me. Number one is he invited me to a small group. And so I did. I started going to this small group, and it was just juniors and senior guys, 11th and 12th grade guys. Um, my youth pastor was leading that group, um, and it was, it was incredible. I mean, I was experiencing things I had never heard before. Again, I didn't grow up in the church, so I didn't know the stories, you know. And so whenever I started going to church, I got tired of hearing the pastor say, oh, you know the story. And then he would keep going on about something else. And I'm like, stop, wait, there are people in your congregation who don't know what you're talking about. And so I thought, that's got to change if I ever have anything to be a part of. And so I got involved in this small group, and I was like a sponge. Like, I just wanted more and more and more and more of this. And I realized that my friends were constantly, like, helping me. Like, we would be at school, and it was kind of like we were in this, like, secret, you know, it kind of felt like we were in this, like, secret society. You know, like, it's like, there's just something when you're in a small group, you're like naturally connected to the bros, you know, in the group. Like, that felt, that's what it felt like. And it was like, oh, that's so cool. And if they saw one of us get out of line or we would do something stupid, they would make sure to say, hey, dude, you did something stupid. You know, like, and here's what you did. And we, we would call each other's sins out, but we wouldn't do it out of condemnation. Be like, dude, this is going to destroy you more. And so we would, we would say, okay, when we bring it back to group, we'd pray for each other. And, um, we were studying scripture. Um, you know, and then we would do things together. Like we would go hang out together. We'd go serve in some kind of form of the church or community together. Like, because that was the point of our small group. And I would say that that's, that's true for every generation. That's, so I want to pull a plug in. If you're not a part of a missional community here at Avenue Church or part of a group in general uh, uh, digging deeper into God's word, serving with one another, helping with, another, with each other, you are missing out on the whole basis and the foundation of what it is to actually be a Christian. You're like, whoa, man, it's challenging. No, I'm serious. That's what Acts is all about. That's what the whole New Testament was about. There were house churches everywhere. And so if we're not actually a part of a group, you're missing out on the point of following Jesus. You can give me all the excuses you want, and I'm still going to go back to you. Prove to me how your lifestyle reflects accent. Prove to me how your lifestyle reflects the New Testament church. Well, I'm busy, and I got this, and I got that, I got this, I got that. So you're more important than Jesus in the church. Okay, that makes sense. You know, like that's been my whole problem with understanding that people need community more than ever. Even in the midst of a pandemic, we have an online community that can meet. And if you're not meeting in that community, you're missing out. You're not living out the Acts Church. And that's what we're building here at Avenue is the Acts Church. Because that's the point. That's what Jesus built because of the resurrection. The second thing that was showed to me is the importance of reading God's word. Um, it was my... It was my uh, in between my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college, um, I had a full-time summer job with actually the guy who brought me to Jesus, which was absolutely cool. We were working at a state park in Indiana, and we were on the trail crew, just me and him. So we'd go through the trails, and we'd clear the paths. We, you know, we'd chop down the trees, and we would, uh, we would actually uh, get on a tractor and pull this one-ton uh, trailer filled with rock and just you know, create um, uh, trails. It was so much fun. 
lot of work, heavy work, but it was a lot of fun. And so what we would do every single day, though, because I learned something so valuable in this relationship, uh, is what's about to happen. So he would say, hey, Nate, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring your Bible with you every day. You know, this is back in the day before um, uh, these things called smartphones, right? We had this cool technology called a book. And we brought that book. And so, uh, and so that book was called the Bible. And when we brought that Bible with us, uh, we would uh, keep it with us. We'd have it with our lunch boxes because we don't come, we don't come in, you know, to eat lunch. It's like once it's time, we just stop wherever we're at in the middle of the forest. Um, and we would eat our lunch and then we'd open our Bibles. And that's what we did every single day at work. And so we started to read scripture, like he was uh, reading scripture with us. We were memorizing our verse a day. That was another thing that we were doing. We were purposely memorizing a verse a day, and we were challenging each other on it. Then we would ask one another questions about the things in our life, sin, and all kinds of stuff. And I thought, this is so fascinating. What I didn't realize until years later is that he was discipling me. I didn't realize that until years later. But then I I started coming to this conclusion, wow, he was teaching me how to dig into God's Word, study God's Word, pray, uh, memorize it, and then live it out because there was always an application to the point. How are we going to live it out? How are we going to live it out? And we would always come back the next day and say, how did you do? Did you do that? Did you do that? Who, Who did you contact? And always, always, always during that week, we would always pray for somebody who didn't know Jesus. Always prayed for somebody who in our life didn't have a relationship with God or was necessarily going to church. Guys, we weren't, we weren't even in ministry. We're not pastors. We're literally just 19 year olds. We're 20 year old people who are just reading God's word and we're saying, who can we reach more? You know, and so that was, became a process and we'd always try to find a way to invite them with us to church and then we'd go out to eat somewhere. You know, you, that, that was all, that was it. That's all we did. And it was incredible how well that worked because it was like we were intentionally digging into God's word, praying for one another, memorizing scripture and it became about who we are. I mean, it was just, it's just one of those things, like, you know, you wish you were in the good old days. Like, the, I wish I almost could go back to that time, because without any influence of anybody around, you know, in the world and in the church and all kinds of stuff, me and him were living life to the fullest. I mean, I looked, it was weird. I actually looked forward to work every day, you know, and I, at that time, I was working three different jobs. I, it was incredible. Two, uh, one full-time job, which was what we were doing the day, and two part-time jobs during the, uh, at night and in the weekend. And, and it was one of those things where I was like, this, I looked forward to every single day because of what we were doing. What I didn't realize too, we were accountability partners. We were holding each other accountable. We wanted to dig into his word. We wanted to make sure that we were fighting our way out of sin. You know, we wanted the Holy Spirit to lead us and direct us. And we wanted to influence people in our culture so that our church would grow, so that uh, the kingdom of God, more importantly than just the church would grow. And we wanted to influence the world. I think this is why God called us both to ministry, because we were so passionate about this. And it's, I almost wish this, I almost wish every single Christian was passionate about this. I mean, everything in my heart says, I just wish I could get Christians and, along with myself, just to be so vulnerable with one another to say, come on, you can do this. Like this was the part of what I wanted to be a part of. This is the church that I have dreamt about being a part of. There's parts of the times when I look and read in history as some of these individuals that we're going to get into today, that I wish I could go back in time and just sit with them, watch them them and pay attention to their life, even if it was going to kill them. Because I know something that so many people don't know is that the resurrection actually happened. You're like, but Nate, you weren't there. Yeah, I had to live a little bit on faith, but my goodness, there is so much physical evidence to point to the resurrection. So much. Even to the point where Jesus, if you're like, okay, yeah, oh, okay, so G- Christianity, you, know, you don't understand if you start to pay attention to the religions of the world, Jesus is seriously in almost every religion of the world somehow, in some way. Isn't that fascinating? Like, even if they don't believe that he's the son of God, but yet he's still in there. He's still somewhere in there. And I'm not, I'm not claiming that the rest of the religions of the world are accurate or correct. In fact, I'm not. But what I am calling out is to say that Jesus seriously is a person who literally did live, who literally did die for our sins, and who literally rose from the dead. And that's the motivation that I hope most of us in this room and watching online will have because this is what God has called us to. So I want to share with you to end this series today. I want, I'm really, I'm like wanting to help so many people grasp this idea that we have so many individuals who have gone before us who is cheering you and I on. 
that we don't have to sit on the sidelines. You do not have to be a pastor to do this because you know why? I wasn't a pastor when I was doing that. I was seriously just in love with Jesus. I was in love with the church and I wanted as many people to know as I possibly could tell. That's it. That's it. That's what it's all about. And so that's what I want to do today. So we're going to look at five individuals. We're going to kind of fly through them. And I want to, uh, because there's a point of why I want to get to this today, that we have got to be men and women who are digging into God's word, that we're believing in the resurrection, and then we're living this stuff out. So let's get to the person number one, Jerome. Um, He lived in 345 to 420 AD. Does anybody remember that? Um, He actually became a saint, obviously, after he died. Because nobody knew. Um, but uh, now here's what's so fascinating. Is he actually created the first common Bible that you and I would ultimately come to love and appreciate. He wrote the Bible in, um, why is my brain leaving me right now? In Latin, that's right. So um, in fact, that's what the Vulgate Bible was. Uh, The Vulgate Bible was written in Latin. So basically he he took the Hebrew scriptures, he took the Greek scriptures and wrote them down and created the first Bible. And the word Vulgate actually means common. So because that was the common language in in Europe at that time is that he wrote a Bible that was common language that the church be able to teach out of that most people would understand, that most people would come to contact with. Um, In 1546, so think about this. Think of these dates right now. In the year 1546, which is 1,141 years later, the Council of Trent declared it the only authentic Latin text of scriptures. So for 1,100 years, this was the primary Bible that people would have read out of or heard of. Now, this didn't come to the normal person. It was, it was obviously read by the church because... You know, they didn't have the printing press. You know, that wasn't created yet. That wasn't invented yet. It was just, here it is. And they would pull out a scroll and they would unravel the scroll and read it. And he was the first one to put it in Latin. And that became the Bible for about a thousand years that people were known of. And here's what he says. He says, make knowledge of the scripture. This is what he said. Make knowledge of the scripture your love. Obviously, this was important to him because he wanted to get this out to people. Uh, Live with them, meditate on them, make them the sole object of your knowledge and inquiries. Guys, people like him, people like him are the reason that you and I have in your hand the scriptures today. Because he wanted to make sure that this became a part of the common crowd. So we have Jerome. And number two, uh, Ignatius of Antioch. So he lived in the year, he was born in 35 AD and he lived till 107 AD. And you're like, how do we know this? It's just we have written documents, historical evidence to show who these individuals are. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, he was the bishop of the city of Antioch. We don't know if he was the bishop, um, uh, we don't know if he was the second or third bishop of Antioch, but what we do know is that he was one, and um, he actually became the first martyr post-New Testament. So you read about New Testament writers, and you read about um, uh, Stephen and the book of Acts. He was actually the first martyr. He was the first one to die for the cause of Christ. Uh, we do know that. Um, but then at the same time, we also have historical evidence that shows that uh, 10 of the 11 disciples that were with Jesus, that walked with Jesus, were martyred as well. And so he actually became the first non-disciple that we know of that was martyred for his faith. Now, what we don't know is we don't know how he was killed, but because of his faith um, in Antioch. Now, why is Antioch such an important term? Is because in that city, it was kind of like the world religions were coming together in the city of Antioch. Um, Jews and Christians and Romans, like that became the epicenter. You think, well, Rome was the epicenter. Well, Rome was the epicenter of Rome, okay? Uh, Antioch was the epicenter of the world's religions. And so they were basically coming together, and he was constantly saying, listen, no, this isn't true. In fact, he was fighting against Gnosticism a lot. Uh, Basically, in a nutshell, Gnosticism was people who were fighting pre-Jesus' teachings. Like, you have to become Jewish in order to follow Jesus. And he was fighting that. He was fighting Gnosticism. And through that, uh, he, was also, he was also fighting against uh, the Roman gods. Now, what we don't know, again, like I said, is how he died. But we do know that um, the Romans called him an atheist. Now, you're like, oh, well, he believed in God. He believed in Jesus. Well, 
what they called atheism is that they didn't, he didn't believe in the Roman gods. As you and I, of course, have come to know that they were all fake anyways. Now, this isn't true. Um, and so he was considered atheist because he didn't believe in the Roman gods. So we, we know that Rome took him, arrested him, actually brought him back to the city of Rome and somehow killed him. And this is what he says. He says, now I began to be a disciple. Let fire and cross, flocks and bees, broken bones, uh, dismemberment come upon me so long as I attain to Jesus Christ. I mean, how many people are willing to say that? Let the things of this world, let the brokenness and the hurtful things of this world come to me as long as I get to follow Jesus. Committed, right? Committed. Uh, Let's go to number three. Uh, uh, It's uh, Bernard of Clairvaux. I like that. Clairvaux. Clairvaux. Um, Okay, I'm moving on. Sorry. I just like to say that. So anyways, um, what was so fascinating for him, obviously he lived in 1090 through 1153 AD. Um, what's so fascinating though with him is that um, both Catholics and Protestants, um, four to five hundred years later, because the Protestant movement started under Martin Luther, even though he didn't realize it was starting under himself yet. Um, but uh, along those lines, um, many people were still using a lot of his writings and a lot of his teachings hundreds of years later. To be quite honest with you, there are still people today who use his teachings to study and understand theology and things like that. A lot of people use him um, in many different ways to teach and help people understand. Now, here's what I wanted to share him for, is because uh, during the 10th century, um, leading, I would say, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 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 12th century, 11th and 12th century, is that um, it was during the time of the Crusades. And if you read anything about history when it came to the Christians' Crusades, there was a lot of evil done in the church. A lot of embarrassing things done in the church. And yet he was a part of that. There were some things that he didn't do. And you're like, well, how's he the champion of the faith? Because God uses broken people to change the world, right? God uses people who don't have it together, who have done bad things in the eyes of Christ, and yet grabs a hold of our hearts and changes the world. I mean, the, the example of this is Saul to Paul in the New Testament. If you're like, I don't know that story, I would challenge you to go back and read the book of Acts leading into the epistles. It's incredible um, what God can do with broken people. And yet, here's what he says. He says, you wish me to tell you why and how God should be loved. And his whole writings were on the love of God. He says, my answer is that God himself is the reason he is to be loved. Like, we don't need another answer to understand God's love or to understand why we are to love God. The fact that God is God is the reason that we are to love him. Like this is the point of what it was all about. So he kind of helped people and he's still helping people to this day through his writings. Another guy in 1813 to 1855, uh, Soren Kierkegaard. And um, he was actually uh, born in Copenhagen, Denmark. And um, I think this is absolutely fascinating. He says, um, the only way to live in this painful existence is through faith. And uh, I think that's one of the things that we can help to understand is that we're going to be people who are to live out faith and to grab and hold on to this and, and understand uh, um, everything that God is wanting to do through us and with us. And, um, but it's the idea that if we're going to get through this life, we are in desperate need of God in our life. Because this life is already really, really difficult. Um, and then there was an article in Christian Today that I want to share with you about a little bit about his life. He says, but to Kierkegaard, faith is not a mental conviction about doctrine nor positive religious feelings, but it's a passionate commitment to God in the face of uncertainty. Faith is a risk and what he would call a leap of faith. That's what Kierkegaard would call it, a leap of faith. And an adventure that requires the denial of oneself to choose faith is what brings authentic human existence. And that was a part of what it was all about. And, and, and the, this came during a time, as, as if you pay attention to Europe today, it's starting to, it's starting to head back up. But the reality is, is that so many people had abandoned the Christian faith or became super comfortable in the, in the Christian faith. Let me, let me challenge you real quick, and I would challenge you to go back and read this guy. This is so fascinating. This was happening in the 1800s. Guys, what was happening in Europe in the 1800s is what's happening in the United States in the 21st century. We're just behind. You know what that is? Mediocrity. A lack of passion. We're hoping the pastor is passionate enough or the band is good enough to reach people. 
and it's happening. And he was fighting it. He's one of many, I could have shared a number of people from Europe in the 1800s who were fighting the same fight. And the church just died. Phew. That's why there's so many cathedrals in, in Europe right now that are absolutely empty. And if they are, if they aren't empty, it's these, it's these grand cathedrals. If you ever get a chance to go over there, it's beautiful. These are incredible buildings, just gorgeous buildings filled with 15 people. It's becoming us. Because men and women aren't sold out for Jesus. We like Jesus. We're just not sold out to him. You know? That was his message. And then the last one I wanted to leave you with is the guy by the name of John Wycliffe. He was born in 1330 and died in 1384. So he didn't live a long life. Um, but he is one of the people that I studied a lot. I wanted to leave, uh, uh, I'll kind of tell you why I'm doing all this, but uh, there's so much information on this guy. It is fascinating, even though this is what, uh, is it 1,700 years later almost? Uh, not quite, but like you just sit here and think about um, his life um, 700 years later. And um, what I think is so fascinating is how... Um, how he stood for, uh, stood for the point. He fought for the poor. He fought for those who um, didn't want to have the... He, he fought for basically f- against the church's power and rule. He wanted to make sure that the common folk weren't deceived and that they actually had the scripture in their hands. Like he wanted to make sure that they knew it. Uh, so he was the first one who was translating it to English. So he took the Bible and he looked at the, actually the Greek text and he looked at Hebrew text and he was the first one to begin transitioning the Hebrew and Greek text to English because obviously he's from, he's from London. And um, he wanted to make sure that that happened. And so what, what really what happened is, is he began translating the New Testament. That became his priority, translating the New Testament. And the church was absolutely against him. They were totally and completely against him. In fact, here's, here's what some of the writings of how the church viewed John Wycliffe. It says, by this translation, meaning the English translation, the scriptures have become vulgar. I mean, he was challenging, in a sense, the Vulgate Bible. And it wasn't because of the Vulgate Bible. It was because those who were teaching the Vulgate Bible were leading them astray. And so he says, uh, so the church is saying the scriptures have become vulgar, and they are more available to lay, and even to women who can read. What? Don't give women, man. You know what women do? I'm not going to say. Then... They were, to learn, they were to learn scholars who have a high intelligence. So the pearl of the gospel is scattered and trodden and underfoot by swine. In a nutshell, the church hated this, right? They didn't want the common folk, including women, to have the Bible because what a travesty that would be. Um, here's his response. Englishmen learn Christ's law best in English. That makes sense. Moses has heard God's law in his own tongue, and so did Christ's apostles. Right? That makes sense. So whatever you want to say, church, the goal is is to get the Bible out to as many people as possible, understanding it through their own language, understanding it through their own tongue. Now, he died before they could uh, complete it, but his friend, he had another guy that worked with him. His name was John Purvey, and he continued this. He continued the translation, and, um, but here's what's so fascinating. Again, there's so much information, but the, it, his life left a, um, how do I say, his life left a, a legacy, and the church hated him, and to, to the point where 43 years after he died, listen to this, 43 years after he died, officials from the church dug up his body, burned his remains, and threw the ashes into the river Swift. 43 years after he was gone, because apparently his message was continuing. He didn't like, they didn't like that. And because of him, because of John Wycliffe, um, today there's a movement that has been going on for about 80 years now. And it's, and it's a Christian organization called Wycliffe Bible Translators uh, because of what he was all about. And their goal is to get every, um, every language in the world translated into the Bible because of his ministry in the in 1350. How insane is that? 700 years later, 
people. I would say, well, 600 years later, it was started because of him and his ministry and things like that. Now, now you're sitting here like, Nate, why are we going through this history lesson? Why have we been talking about this for the last few weeks? And, and here's why. Here's why, I wa- here's why I wanted to bring this together, and here's how we're going to bring this together. It's Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And so what is so fascinating about Hebrews is, is we don't know who the writer is. We don't know who, uh, um, how this came about. But what we do know is that during this time that the Jewish nation, specifically Christians who were former Jews, they were, they were at a point where they were just disheartened. They were broken. You actually can see that in the writing. These were men and women who were like, we well, you know Jesus isn't coming back. It seems like we're going to have to keep fighting forward. But all I know is that we're dying, we're being in prison, we're being beat up, you know, all for this message. And they were starting to lose hope. And the writer of Hebrews wrote this letter to encourage and inspire these Christians to keep fighting, to keep moving forward. Believe me, it's coming. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. But the world needs to know the hope of Christ. And that's why they wrote the letter in Hebrew, called Hebrews. And so in Hebrews chapter 11, many know this as the faith chapter, the hall of faith as others call it. And they were writing, he was writing this, or, or perhaps she, um, depending on the studier, the theologian, um, uh, uh, the person though who was writing this was to say, hey, do you remember? Do you remember? Here, I want to strengthen your faith. I want to keep you moving forward. So here's what it is about. He says in Hebrews 11, and I want to read it for the first few verses. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. So there is a bit of us who, right, we got to live on faith. We got to know and believe that what happened 2,000 years ago is still true to this day, that it happened for us to keep fighting, to keep moving forward. This is what faith is all about. So through their faith, then this writer begins to explain to these Jewish Christians, through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. It's kind of like, let's go back and remember. Let's go back and remember. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith. So we go all the way back to Genesis. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of of his gifts. And although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example— of faith. Verse, uh, verse 5. It was by faith that Enoch, which is an incredible story, is that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. How cool would that be to be somebody who has pleased God so much? He's like, yeah, I don't want you to die. How cool would that be? Right? I mean, I would love to be in that boat. I'm not in that boat. But I would love to be in that boat or strive to be in that boat. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Like he was intentionally, purposefully seeking the Lord. At, at verse 7, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. If you know the story of Noah, there it is. Um, but you know, as the flood happens, right, they were making fun of him. He was building a boat in a desert, in a desert where they had not seen rain. And then all of a sudden, who's laughing now, right? Because it was by faith. How about this? It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. So good. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac, his son, and so did Jacob, his grandson, who inherited the same promise. And Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. I mean, he knew what was coming and he didn't get to experience, we're going to see here in a second, but he knew what was coming. And because God has asked him to do it, he was the beginning movement. You could almost argue that all the way back with Noah, right? It was Noah that God began this, this thing all that he was going to do, that he was going to restore the world and through his offspring, Abraham come and then the nation of Israel comes, right? And so, and so if you keep reading Hebrews chapter 11, we talk about Sarah, you look at Isaac and Jacob, you know, this is Abraham's family, 
You begin to look at Moses' parents. You see Moses himself. You see the nation of Israel. And again, Israel is a family. It became a great nation, but it started off as a family. You begin to see Rahab the prostitute who is in the line of Christ. What even Jewish? But and she was a prostitute in the line of Christ, which is so much significant to our faith as Christ followers. You begin to look at Samson and King David and Samuel and the prophets. These were all men and women who have gone before us, who have lived out their faith, who have trusted in the Almighty because of the Word of God. And they were encouraging these, uh, at the early church to get this going to make sure that this all happens. And then in in, uh, uh, verse 13 of Hebrews, it says, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. Now here, they agreed that they were foreigners and nomads. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. People, We have our Hebrews 11. We just looked at five people who've gone before us, who have fought for the word of God, who have fought for the resurrection. We looked at three individuals the last three weeks who have done the same thing. So now we're up to eight, right? But it just doesn't stop there. We have our Hebrews 11. There's another person, Cement of Alexandria, 150 to 215 uh, AD. Um, again, this person was also one of those individuals who was fighting against Gnosticism and, 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 and the things that are going on in the world at that time. Antony of Padua, 1195 to 1231. Uh, just another example of somebody who given their life over to Jesus. And again, go and study these people if you're interested. William Tyndale, one of the most incredible people that we have in the history of our of our our culture, of our society. Um, he was the one who actually translated the entire Bible from uh, uh, Hebrew and Greek to, uh, um, to the English language. And I would even argue, even to this day, that he has the best translation because he would look at the scriptures and he would, he would change words in him. What you see when you read the Bible, when you, when you see the word church, he didn't translate it church. He translated ecclesia, congregation. He, ca- he called it an assembly because that's what we are. But we have concluded that church is a building and we have been living in that. But it's not the right translation. We should not be using the name church. We should be using congregation or assembly because it's we who are the church. And William Tyndale died by the church because he challenged the very translation and very meaning of the scripture. Incredible, incredible individuals. Um, John, and then we have some more. We have John Wesley, uh, again, started a movement in England. Um, a part of also, you might know the, uh, the Methodist brothers. And, and so uh, that movement came and the Wesleyan theology and all that stuff that came about. Uh, George Whitfield, uh, 1700s, and then Elizabeth Fry. Now, Elizabeth Fry is incredible. Um, this is so funny in 1780, 1845. But she was a prisoner, uh, a prison reformer. Meaning, here's what she did. She would go into male prisons and teach them how to become men in society again. To like restore them as individuals. And he, she would read them the Bible. They they would find Christ and she would teach them how to follow Jesus in the midst of a prison. And then when you get out to be somebody in society and follow Christ in society. Like that's what she did. A woman. And look at this. In the 17 and 1800s. You don't, you don't see that. You don't hear that. But that's exactly what she did. Incredible, incredible ministry of what she was doing. In fact, a lot of our prison ministries, uh, uh, somehow and always, uh, uh, somehow in our culture, and even people who study this, will always come back to Elizabeth Fry. It's just somebody who gets it. Um, then we have others. Uh, these are a lot of the people that we know in, in England and in the United States. Charles Finney, Billy Sunday, Oswald Chan, uh, Chambers. I can't stop reading his information. C.S. Lewis, uh, a former atheist who became a follower of Christ and now has helped so many people. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, died in World War II, if you don't know his story, but it's an incredible story. A German pastor who was against Hitler and fought against Hitler, but at the same time he was out and he went back in. He chose to go back in to minister to the Jews and, and hopefully uh, stop Hitler from his, from his regime and things like that and ended up dying um, because of that very reason. They killed him, but he was committed to it because of the resurrection and because of the scripture. And a lot of people know Billy Graham. Guys, these are just a handful of people who have gone before us, but we have our Hebrews 11. And so the motivation that came out of all of these individuals were men and women on their knees, men and women in scripture and wanting to bring compassion 
who who had a passion and a fire to love our world, to get the word out, to do the things that God has called us to do. So why should we go through this series? It's because by God's grace, you and I have been given scripture. We have been given heroes. We've been given the Holy Spirit to train us, to teach us, and to equip us. And they didn't do it because they were religious. They did it because they were sold out to the resurrection. See, if it wasn't for my friend, if it wasn't for Brandon, if it wasn't for him, I would have never experienced what transformation can become in a small group. I would have never experienced Jesus. And I would have never, ever understood why I serve and help people along the way. Why to share my faith. I mean, there are countries right now we have missionaries in that we have to absolutely prove to people, to Christians in other parts of the world, that you don't just not share your faith and hope the Holy Spirit does the work. The point is, is that you are the hands and feet of Christ and the Holy Spirit wants to work through you. It's not somebody else's job to do. It's your job. And that's what we're trying to help people around the world do. But more importantly, that's what we're trying to help Americans do. Do you know that the United States right now, right now in our world, we are the third highest mission field in the world. Did you know that? Do you know more people are sending people from other countries to the United States because we're not doing our job well? (laughs) We're the third highest mission field in the world, the United States, from other countries. And I'm grateful for them. I'm grateful for them. But church, that should wake us up. That should wake us up. That's the point. That's what it's all about is that we are to be people who are digging into God's word. We are to be doing it together. We are to be in community. (laughs) We are to be following in the footsteps of those who have gone before us. The whole idea of what Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. To which we to say to others, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. And if you're a Christian who can't say those terms, that means you're not doing it. We should be telling the world, follow me as I follow Christ. Because the goal isn't, I'm the answer. It's that the answer is living in me. The answer is living in the church. That we are the vehicle of hope that leads to Jesus. That we aren't the answer. We're just the vehicle that leads to the answer. That's the point. We've had so many people go before us to change the world. The question is, is, are you willing to do the same thing? And when I mean changing the world, I'm thinking of one person. Who's the one person in your life that needs the world to change for? And what are we doing about it? That was the point. And so I would say, let's get back on that horse. You and I have got to start discipling people. We have got to start reaching people. We have to be intentionally inviting people. And I like to use the word invest and invite. If we're just inviting, we're we're only doing half the job. We are to invest and to individuals. We have people in our lives who don't know the gospel. We have people in the church who aren't growing in their own faith. 
And we need to help one another. We need to love one another. That's what God calls us to do. The world will know you're my disciples by how well you love one another. That's the point. So let's be like them. We have our Hebrews 11. Let's do what they did. Let's not be afraid of the world. But let's love the world and show them God's mercy and God's reign and invite them to have a relationship like my friend Brandon did to me. It's long term, it's investing, and it's changing the world. So here's your questions. Number one, what is something that stood out to you in the last four weeks that will help you or someone moving forward? Maybe as an individual, maybe as a person, but who was somebody in the last four weeks? Or what was something in the last four weeks that can help you to help others move forward. Number two, how have you seen God change people and communities through the Bible? How have you seen God change people, individuals, or communities? It could be a group of people. It could be the, our community in itself. Um, how has it changed through the Bible? And number three, do you err more toward the side of teaching yourself without submitting to Christian community or of relying on the teaching of others without reading the Bible for yourself? Which side do you err on And why are both necessary? Why are both necessary? And that's what I want to leave you with today. Now, next week, we're going to start a brand new series entitled Fruit of the Spirit. I'm really excited about this series because this begins to look at the DNA of person who follows Jesus. Do you know what, if you want to know if you're a Christ follower or not, or do you want to help people become fully devoted Christ followers or not? We look at the fruits of the Spirit. And you're going to see that these aren't actually plural. It's singular. We're going to talk about that next week. Um, So for the next few weeks, we're going to be diving into this. And it's going to lead us all the way up to our meal packing event on... um on Palm Sunday, and then Easter Sunday, we'll celebrate the resurrection, and then we'll begin something brand new. So this is going to lead us all the way up to our meal packing event over the next few weeks. So let me pray for you. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for these this last four weeks. God, the goal isn't to come and just listen to a message. That's not the goal. The goal is to kind of be people who are going to grab a hold of this idea and move forward. That we're going to be people of faith that have gone before us to move forward. That we are going to be people who are sold out because of the resurrection. That there are people in our lives who are hurting and broken and and, and desiring a deeper relationship with something or someone. And that needs to be Jesus through the church. So God, thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. Thank you for this series. uh, And thank you for those who are applying this. But God, I pray that as the church as a whole, we would do this and move forward in this. We love you. And it's in Christ we pray. Amen.